It's punk rock bowling time. That's right. For the 24th year, one of the greatest festivals on earth, in my opinion, returns to downtown Las Vegas the weekend of May 25th, 26th, and 27th. I have had some of my greatest times playing this thing and just hanging out of this thing. You want to know how much this festival speaks to Turnout of Punk's mindset? The headliners are Devo, Descendants, and Madness. Every day of this festival, the lineup is stacked with amazing bands of all types and stripes of punk and hardcore from all different eras, from ska to post-hardcore. We're talking like Bratmobile to Rock from the Crypt to Stiff Little Fingers to the Cosmic Psychos to Scowl to Chad. I just... And then there's also all these late night after shows which are happening. And you wouldn't believe the lineup of these things from the Zeros to Agnostic Front and everything in between, this festival is out of control for fans of punk. Uh, so I hope I will see you there. Because this isn't like some sort of festival that you just go to and the bands are secluded in some sort of backstage area. Bands and fans and just punks alike are all just taking over downtown Las Vegas. So you turn around and all of a sudden you're gambling beside John Doe from X. I don't, I don't know if John Doe gambles but if you turn around on the buffet line you'll probably see me and you better believe we're gonna be talking about punk music and because this festival loves this podcast as much as this podcast loves this festival punk rock bowling is bringing you a series of special episodes so each and every week i will have an episode going up featuring someone that's playing this festival and hot damn are there some good ones coming Head over to punkrockbowling.com and hopefully I see you in downtown Las Vegas, May 25th, 26th, and Welcome to another edition of Turn Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damien Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, major influence on me, you may know him from Sonic Youth, you may know him from currently playing with Butch Tetris, you may even know him from The Crucifix. Steve Shelley is the guest on the show today, and boy, this is a good one. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turnedoutpunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is written by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, and he will get the message to me. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram at left for damien There is a Facebook page, an Instagram page, a YouTube page, and a TikTok page, all for this podcast right here. Those can be found at Turned Out of Punk on those respective platforms. If you want to support the show, tell all your friends about it. Let them all know that you enjoy this podcast that is done twice a week here over, uh, over on the uh, feed these days. Uh, you can also check out the band I play in. We are called Fucked Up. You can find out more information at fuckedup.cc. We have just released, uh, well, an older record. Well, not older. A newish record is finally up on all sorts of streaming places called Cops. And then we have also put up a brand new single, uh, Being Annoying, Born Annoying, Born Annoying. Uh, that's annoying that I can't remember. Uh, but you can find out more over at fuckedup.cc or at fucked up on Twitter or Instagram and check out those records. I'm pretty stoked about both of them. They're raging. Don't worry, it's not uh, poppy fucked up. It's, it's tear your face off fucked up. That's my kind of fucked up. Anyway, on to today's show. Today on the show, as I said off the top, a legend Steve Shelley. And I tell this to Steve, there's this part in, I believe it's Schizophrenia, which is the opening part of 1991, The Year Punk Broke, an incredible documentary by filmmaker Dave Markey about Nirvana, and well, Sonic Youth mainly, but Nirvana opening for them and Dinosaur Jr.'s in it and uh, Gumball, Ramones. It's what got me into punk, but there's this opening number of Schizophrenia that's 
unbelievable. And there's a shot of Steve Shelley playing drums with Maraca. And I remember seeing that as a early entry point into punk rock. And that blew my mind. I know he didn't invent that, but that was the first time I had seen it. And oh my gosh, uh, he is one of my favorite drummers ever. And someone that obviously Sonic Youth being a huge, hugely important band and his involvement in Sonic Youth being hugely important and influential, but also because of the Crucifix, a band that comes up on this podcast all the time. Uh, we, we go into it uh, extensively on this episode. I, I should add another place that goes into it extensively is Sam McFeeders, the great Sam McFeeders, former guest of the show, punk rock hardcore legend. In his book, Mutations, uh, he has a great chapter about the Crucifix and Doc Dart that I strongly recommend reading. I blank on the title of the book in this episode, but there you have it. I also blank on the name of the embassy, mistakenly calling it Call the Office, which is another historic venue in London, Ontario. But the venue we are we are trying to think of is the embassy when that comes up later on. Uh, I think that's it for notes on this episode. Head over to wharfcatrecords.com and... Uh, Yes, dot com. And check out Bush Tetris Records. The incredible They Live in My Head LP from last year is fantastic. You can also pick up a uh, Rhythm and Paranoia, the best of Butch Tetris as well, which is a great entry point to this band that is hugely important and weirdly overlooked. They will be playing shows this summer with uh, Steve. Unfortunately, not playing shows anytime soon uh, that I can report about hearing or anything is Sonic Youth. But you can pick up and relive an incredible era for this band. This band's like like my Grateful Dead. There's just certain live eras that you can kind of go back and revisit with Sonic Youth. And uh, just always an incredible live band. So most recently, they have reissued the legendary Sonic Youth bootleg. Feels weird talking about a bootleg like that. Uh, Walls Have Ears, which was a double LP I have a, I believe, three shows back in 85. Uh, Sonic Youth has now uh, lovingly reissued this thing. And you can pick that up over at, uh, you know, where's the best place to grab that these days? Just Google it. Uh, anyway, I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll have a link in the bio. Or the description. Not the bio. The description for the show. All right. It's late. I'm not going to ramble on anymore. Here's Steve Shelley. Unturned out a punk. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's been a while. And, uh, I've, you know, obviously over the years, I've met you in person a few times. We've played some shows together, but I've never been able to punish you like you're going to get punished right now. So, <laughs> really? All oh, right. my <laughs> God, dude. There's so much, so much I've wanted to talk to you about. Um, I but, have no idea where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. It's just, it's, it's all uh, nerdy. It might test the memory banks, but we'll find out. Uh, I got to start them off the way they all start off though, which is how'd you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever came across it? You know, I, um, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Michigan. And um, I was like a, a teen when punk was happening. And I, I was really into the Beatles. That was my thing in the mid seventies. And, um, and I just started hearing about this music that um, was weird and dangerous and, you know, and uh, you know, um, seeing Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious on the cover of uh, Rolling Stone. Uh, that was big, but, but a little bit, I think one of the things that that clinched me though is more of a post-punk thing is um starting to see some of those bands on Saturday Night Live was a big thing for me as a young teenager. So catching uh Devo and and especially talking heads, um who played art artists only and uh take me to the river, um, um, which is a phenomenal uh cover that's better than the original um which is hard to hard to do and um so anyways I, it was like it was midwest things like the media you know god bless the media <laughs> and um 
<laughs> and uh you know and hearing about uh hearing about the pistols and and post-punk did you like uh you know because also there's you know they bring up those snl performances and there's kind of like it's amazing what an on-ramp they were for people you know like this kind of see this stuff on tv and i also like that b-52's performance sure uh, as well and they're all they're both they're all three of those are just like all time there i guess there's also the elvis costello one that's up yes there exactly yeah and and then you know and the stuff that would appear on fridays a little bit after saturday night live you got to see the jam and and the, of course the clash and and uh, you know and everyone how much awareness was there just kind of being a, a young kid about like Detroit rock and roll, like, you know, like the proto punk stuff that would have been happening a few years earlier. Yeah, that was all, I, I didn't learn about that until I moved to New York, yeah. um, <laughs> early Michigan rock. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we knew about the Stooges, you know, but, but to tell you the truth, it's like when I grew up, it was, it was Seeger and, and REO, you know, that's yeah. what was, that's what was going on. And so when you know talking heads or elvis or or anyone appeared on one of these shows it was it, you know it was like something that you you had to have you know well it's funny because like i don't think yeah the stooges records don't get reissued till the late 80s right like it's no no we knew for my little gang we knew about um um the idiot and lust for life and that was our gateway to the stooges because David Bowie produced, you know, this Michigan uh, vocalist, you know, <laughs> oh, he's also on a band called the Stooges. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it took a while to learn about that. And the MC5, you, you, you know, definitely. Um, but the. Yeah, a lot of it I, I didn't really dig into until I joined Sonic Youth. Where did you kind of go from seeing this stuff on Saturday Night Live in terms of like, was there any sort of local bands happening around the time? Because there's like such a incredible deluge of punk from michigan um not where i'm from i was from a small town um about two and a half hours north of detroit and i was in detroit was not easy access for me until after i graduated from high school and owned my own car um because you just you just couldn't get anywhere in michigan without a car um so um i, I didn't get to, to check out things in Detroit until um, the early eighties. When did you start like playing music though? Cause like you, you have that band, the no zones really early on. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was um, almost my, em my embarrassing first band, but not, not quite <laughs> embarrassingly what? named first band, but <laughs> <laughs> what was the very first band? The first one was called Deja Vu. <laughs> That's awesome. That's like deja voodoo, right? Like that's right. classic up here. So it's like 12 year olds, like it's naming a band. <laughs> so was that punk, that stuff or like new or like post-punk kind of vibes or? No, it was like, um, it was like a garage band. It, it was made up of, uh, that was kids just learning to, you know, the three chords and, and, uh, and uh, bashing it out on the drums. We played um, Alice Cooper, Seeger, um, probably some Beatles in there because we were all Beatles nuts and um, trying to, I, ah, yeah, it cover band. The first one was a cover band. Yeah. What about No Zones? What was the kind of vibe of that band? Uh, that was New Wave and it started uh, uh, playing some originals. <laughs> so was it like, like how did No Zones play shows? Like were, were you able to kind of play? Yeah, with other we bands? would play um not with other bands, but we would we would like rent the library um um you know performance hall and 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 you know you know oh you can get the library auditorium for 60 bucks. And so we would rent that and you know charge a dollar to get in or something and hope that you could make your money back. But but um but we were too young to drink, too young to be in bars. So you know we we were like a, you know, a garage band that, you know, played lawns, you know, lawn parties and shit. A DIY punk band putting yes. on your own shows. Well, in our own way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. The, the, the best thing about punk was that it was sort of permission to be amateurish with what you're doing. Yeah. yeah and, and to play music before you could drink, you know, yeah. it's like drinking was such a like it was so intertwined with rock and roll, you know, you know, the whole ridiculous party and, and um, are you fucked up and all that, you know, all that was so intertwined. And so when you were 13 or 14 and you didn't care about alcohol, 
you know, punk and post-punk were were a really good avenue to investigate. So what was the vibe of Faith and Morals? Because that's the band you do after, I believe, right? Mm, yeah, that's a little bit later. That was um that was um that was a band riffing on Joy Division and New Order. But by this point, are you kind of playing outside of your town? Are you getting out a little bit more? Yeah, um, Faith and Morals was a East Lansing band. I would drive from Midland to East Lansing and practice or play a show. And those were becoming more like club shows. Um, we would play, um, um, we would play sort of uh, empty warehouses in, in Lansing, but then we would go to Detroit and we would play like um like a gay bar or a gay disco at the time that's where you know where we were welcome to play at that at that point in time so what's the scene like at that point like did you because like eventually you wind up in a band with steve miller from the fix like did you play with the fix or ever see the fix oh yeah yeah oh that's awesome yeah i think the fix were maybe one of the first uh local punk bands i saw in, in lansing yeah yeah definitely at um a place called Rick's Cafe. Legendary. That's yeah. incredible. So do you do you have a copy of Vengeance? I don't, but that was probably one of the first um do-it-yourself singles that I ever saw back in the day. That and the Necro seven inch would have been, you know, that they actually had those at shows and like, oh wow, you can make a record, you know, just slowly uh getting enlightened with all this. Well, that's what I love about the Detroit stuff that's happening, because obviously the Detroit hardcore thing has become really celebrated with like Necros and I guess throw, lumping the fix in there and negative approach. But mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. also like L7 and Blight and, you know, like yourself with Strange Fruits, like there's a sort of uh, real arty bend to all of it, too, that's happening, like other like sort of an artier edge to the scene as well. Yeah, it's it's funny that the hardcore of, of Michigan has resonated for so long. Um, because to me, L7 really represented that era the the best, you know. Mm -hmm. To me, they were Detroit Detroit independent rock in the early 80s. They, they seem like the band that kind of like straddled both scenes. Like they could play with the hardcore bands and then they could they were also like really arty and could open for big new wave band. Right, right. They would be the band that um um in 1982 or 83, if Iggy was coming through and playing the Royal Oak M Music Theater, L7 would be the band uh, to open or or U2 or whoever was coming through in the early 80s. So would Strange Fruits ever play like the Freezer or well, like was it sort of like a different venue circuit? Yeah, I'm not sure if we ever did play the, the Freezer. We might have. Um, we've definitely played with all of those folks, but maybe not at the Freezer. I know the Crucifix played at the Freezer. Um, not, not sure about Strange Fruit and also same band, Spastic Rhythm Tarts. It might have been Spastic, Spastic Rhythm Tarts might have played there. Is that like in, were you like aware of like Nihilistic Spasm Band by that point or is it like? Not at complete... all. No, no, never. So what was sort of the influence on like the artier stuff? Because like Strange Fruit is like, it's fascinating when you go back and listen to it because it is, it's like really dense and and really experimental that early on. And so we... different from The Fix, obviously yeah yeah and it was so surprising when steve asked to, to play with us he actually he actually asked hey could i jam with you guys and and uh one of our guitar players had just moved to chicago so that's when when steve came in and it was a, it was a weird mix but um the band actually existed longer without steve than with than than with steve miller and it was kind of inspired not kind of it was inspired by the pop group and uh New Age Steppers and uh, the Slits and, uh, you know, Brit, Brit post-punk. Uh, and then and then uh, and then the birthday party also started creeping in there. So where are you hearing these records from? Like, was there a record store in particular that kind of was like bringing all this stuff in on import or is it yeah. like, is there a college station or anything? Yeah. Um, the first indie music I ever heard on a college station was on um wcmu um i think that's their call letters in mount pleasant mm. and um and the place that we would go and buy uh independent records or imports would be flat black and circular in east lansing and i think that place is still going 
I think it's like a legendary spot too. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely bought one or two Joy Division 12 inches there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how, you know, kind of dependent you were on having that cool store or having that cool college station just to hear stuff like because it was information was such a a commodity at that point. sure sure it was it was really different <laughs> yeah it was, was really different <laughs> was there a lot of sort of like a tape scene and tape trading scene in terms of that stuff because like it, it seems like yeah. a lot of bands are putting out vinyl really early well tape co compilation tapes amongst friends who had no money so you would get a comp tape and it would have you know um you know the Minutemen from sickles and hammers or or something you know but like just just things that you never saw or had a chance to grab and and I, I definitely you know heard early uh dna because of compilation tapes and so that was really really uh a loved uh, um ritual back then <laughs> yeah and it would it definitely kind of has a uh like there's there's like this sort of physical remnant of it too yeah. where like there's you know like these tapes never went away so like years later you can stumble on a tape that someone made you mm -hmm. and there's still that kind of uh immediacy to it yeah were you like aware of all you mentioned dna like so were you aware of like uh, the the no wave stuff that would have been happening in uh, new york around that time just some of it because you know we couldn't afford to grab everything so you grab the few singles or records that you could grab and then you would have to rely on your friends for these mixtapes but um but yeah i was aware of the the no wave and and um you know in in little bits and pieces you know what whatever would would flow to the midwest so it must have been kind of exciting i guess when you arrive in new york years later and all of a sudden you're in this scene or were you kind of like already in the scene because of the crucifix like would the crucifix cross over with those worlds at all well, no, we went there and played, but um, but but it was moving there was a, a totally different thing than than being there, um, you know, playing CBs with the Crucifix. I mean, being there every day, yeah, yeah, it's 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 fascinating. It's a fascinating place, and it, it still is, you know. Well, I guess by that point too, like a lot of those people had moved on to sort of the cinema transgression sort of stuff, or you know, like it <laughs> felt like that was the continuation mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some people were you know working for tv or, or for for, yeah. for film or you know so yeah that a lot of that had moved on um, um so how did the crucifix come together um i think doc dart uh saw the no zones play in lansing once or twice and um and he hit up the bass player and i um if we wanted to do something uh, at some point. And so I think he and his friend, uh, Terry, um, drove, drove up to Michigan or, or drove up to Midland uh, one weekend and uh, played with Scott and I in Scott's mom's basement. And I think that's how we started getting together. And then, then uh, the next time Scott and I would uh, drive down to Lansing and practice in Doc's basement and Terry had disappeared and now um, Doc's younger cousin, uh, Joe Dart, was who was still in high school, was uh, was playing uh, was playing guitar. Uh, so, so I guess there's overlap between uh, Strange Fruit and Crucifix. There was the both both bands existed at the same time. Uh, both bands were sort of part time bands because, um, you know, people were in school or had real jobs or whatever. So you know um i would kind of flip flop from one group to the other whoever was more active i would i would show up and do whatever i could it it seems like crucifix there's a lot of uh wreckage in the wake of the shows and and just sort of the legend <laughs> of the band and it must be weird to also then be in this other group having to deal with sort of the the one band like is it a different culture around the bands at that time or the did they kind of exist together? No, they existed together. Um, because even when you played on a um a hardcore show, you know, everybody had, you know, they still had records by the pop group and the gang of four. So, you know, it was it was still people were open-minded, I mean, uh, for that sort of thing. 
Yeah, it hadn't divided as much as yeah. it does later on. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, like Strange Fruit was still playing hardcore shows. Yeah. And Crucifix never really fit in either. You know, we were we were sort of a, an odd, an odd cousin to the whole thing. Well, it's funny because it kind of invents an archetype of yeah. a band, the Crucifix, that exists in, in hardcore to this day. And I think, you what's know, that? Like, a band that doesn't really fit in uh. with a lead singer that is confrontational mm -hmm. and and that's kind of like you know I, like i'd be lying if i said fucked up didn't exist in this sort of archetype uh -huh. away uh -huh. especially in the beginning and it really is there, there's tons like you know like hoax uh the feeders a few years later from mm -hmm, phoenix mm -hmm. there's like this you know and i think gg allen would be sort of the worst version of yeah. this thing because it's kind of different but like this sort of this becomes a thing that always exists in hardcore to this day yeah it's funny i would never have connected gg allen to the crucifix but it's funny that you um that you you say that well i'm not the first actually it's funny <laughs> in tony retman's book there's actually a, a quote from matt o'brien and he talks about how doc dart was the proto gg allen huh i i don't believe that um, but it's possible, but, but, um, um, it's yeah. obviously a lot more cerebral. Like it's, it's, I was actually, I wanted to get your take on Gigi Allen because when you show up in New York, Gigi's there, Thurston winds up doing that show with them and Jay, you know, I no, think Thurston, I, Thurston, Thurston no show. that show. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. show the show in the end. That's right. <laughs> Jay, Jay winds up playing and Cosloy, you know, obviously is, does the band with them and stuff, but I imagine you would have had a real I was going to ask you, what was your take on Gigi having, as according to Matt O'Brien, been in the proto Gigi band in a way, but a lot more cerebral. Like, I don't mean to be kind of, you know, completely different, like not as scatological and, and, yeah. and ultimately abusive as Gigi Allen. I, yeah, I, it's a stretch for me. me yeah. to, to, it's a stretch just to relate doc to that. It, it was, I think it was, you know, it was, uh, homage uh, to the Stooges to Iggy more so than than anything else um I think when I got to New York I I think Gigi was something that we joked about and but we didn't take very seriously you know and uh, although the the fright factor was <laughs> was definitely uh serious but um I don't think I really you know really was that interested in Gigi until like I was on tour years later and someone played me like a, you know, one of his country albums. And I was, <laughs> I was just dumbfounded, you know, that he, that he did that too. Well, it's interesting how geography plays into music so much. Like, you know, when Gigi gets to New York, eventually kind of winds up in that performance art scene a little bit, right? Like there's that compilation with Annie Sprinkle and him mm -hmm. and, and a bunch of people doing mm -hmm. like talking performance art. And he kind of gets, yeah, there's, a, there's that actually in the last Gigi show when he's wandering around the Lower East Side, there's a great moment where these two, this art couple comes up to them and hands them his daughter like, hey, Gigi, great to see you. Like, what's going on? What are you doing here? And he's covered in blood and shit. And like with the Crucifix, I think if you had guys had been in New York, it would be interesting to think about where you would have fit in and where mm -hmm. what it would have been, because it is a lot more cerebral than a lot of bands that you would have been playing with at that time, kind of on the hardcore circuit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think we could have played um, the the hardcore gigs at that time to many more times because you know um, we played a hardcore matinee one of the first times in New York, and um, and Doc is just you know giving the New York punks just the you know just the, the hardest time. You know, he's just he's so you know, he's, he's, he's terrible with, with the audience, you know, it's, it's, it's easy, easily, they could churn on him. It's, it must've been like weird on those tours, like showing up into a place like DC or showing up into Boston or, or New York, like places which have kind of hard scenes, especially the hardcore scene where there's like people that react. Like I, I find Detroit, like, you know, obviously this is just, or me as a fascinated person who spends a lot of time thinking about, it, I wasn't there, but I find, 
what the thing I love most about that kind of Michigan Detroit scene is that it is so open to music and so open to different forms of expression within underground culture. Whereas some places have a little more restrictive views on performance and how you should perform as a musician at around that time. And mm -hmm. so it must've been weird rolling into some of these cities as this band. Yeah. I don't know. It was, it was weird rolling in anywhere when you, you know, you had never been on tour before, you know, our, our first tour um, was in a school bus, you know, rented by um, yippies in, in New York city for this rock against Reagan tour. So, you know, we're traveling with a, a bus full of hippies and, and, you know, 1982 or 83, whenever that was. So it was, it's, it's all bizarre. <laughs> yeah. It's funny too, because you bring up the yippies, they're the sort of internal kind of presence in the early punk scene from DOA's management and subhumans management to stuff that's going on in New York. Like the yippies seem to be sort of this true proto-punk ideological scene in a way. They, they certainly su uh, supported it or, um, uh, you know, in whatever the way they could, I guess. Well, because Madam's Organ in D.C., where the Bad Brains used to go, was like a yippie space, wasn't it, or something? Or like they, they had some yippie connection, too, even in D.C. That's before my time, so I'm, I I don't know about I that one. It's just so interesting how it's like, yeah, like in, in every different scene, it's sort of like involved in some sort of way. It's some sort yeah. of like the, the hangover well, from the 60s. Well, they were responsible for getting us out of Michigan. You know, we, I think we'd hardly, hardly been out of state. You know, maybe we made it to Ohio and, and well, and Wisconsin and Chicago. Yeah. So how did that, how did the name of the band start to spread? Is it through Touch and Go or is it through Alternative Tentacles? Because it must have been before the Alternative Tentacles thing. Yeah. Um, I would say Maximum Rock and Roll. You know, um, we, we had a, a demo cassette that we uh, sold there. And I think that's how a lot of people uh, found out about the band. Did you guys get out to the West Coast ever with the Crucifix? Yeah, we did um, opening for the, the Dead Kennedys. Um, I forget which year, if it's 83 or 84, um, but it's a, a West Coast tour. Um, um, kind of maybe from San Francisco up to Seattle. And a lot of Oregon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I know because this tour comes up a lot on this podcast. And it's okay. It's something else I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, years later with Sonic Youth, you wind up meeting and interacting with, I'm sure, a lot of the people that you interacted and met with during the Crucifix, yeah. you know, like, yeah, just like two years before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, or even like later, like Toby talks about that show and how terrifying Doc Dart was. And he grabbed her at one point and it freaked oh, wow. her out and stuff and then so you're meeting these people later on was it ever awkward or was it always like sort of this interesting were people always excited because of the connection or yeah it was it was usually funny um i remember um pulling into um to sound check uh on a sonic youth nirvana show um in the in the northwest somewhere maybe maybe in oregon again and um and Kurt was on stage checking his guitar and he was playing, um, I don't know if he saw me or what, but he was playing the little guitar riff from um, um, By the Door, the really annoying uh, song from our album. And, and no one else in the world would know that stupid guitar line, but I just had to, you know, look at him and, and smile. But that's usually how, you know, people would acknowledge it with a, with a wink, you know. Have you, have you, are you aware of how there's been like this massive resurgence in popularity for the Crucifix in the last sort of like two or three years? No, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. My kids are becoming to be uh, <laughs> dropping off music gear. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> Just on the podcast, bud. Oh, sorry. No problem. <laughs> Keep it down. Okay, buddy. Love you. So they're, they're super into Nirvana now. So they want to start a band. It's very, oh, very, good. very exciting <laughs> to see happen. It's a, a very interesting thing because they have no interest in what I do at all. Oh, funny. <laughs> Nirvana's the gateway. But uh, funny. Yeah, but in sort of the last three or four years, there's been this wild resurgence in popularity or an interest in the band to the point that there's also like a Doc Dart secret society thing where people, oh, are, wow. people get Doc Dart propaganda packages in the mail randomly. And no one knows where they're coming from these days. Like, obviously oh, not funny. Not anything connected with a band, just fans, but it's yeah, because it's always been a band that 
like is right there in terms of importance to this thing. Huh. Like, but but old surfers and crucifix, I think, are the ids for for hardcore in a lot of ways. Well, that's funny because you know, I don't I don't look back and wish things had been different too 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 often. But I wonder like why didn't the crucifix become more like the butthole surfers? You know, sort of more like just sort of let our freak flag fly but um i don't know it was uh it was the time and this the place i guess that uh affected a lot of that but i i didn't know any of this about the crucifix though i mean to me the record isn't even in print so you know and, and i don't know why people have told me it's because doc asked them to keep it out of print but um um it's but, weird that, you know that and that, but we live in a time where that doesn't even matter right like we live yeah. in this era mm -hmm. where now the legend just can kind of build on its own and i think yeah i think it's it takes time right like i think i always point to jandic as being the ultimate sign that it takes time mm. for everyone to kind of find their fan base and stuff and i think crucifix the whole way through there was always a cult around that band like it was huh. never it it was never like an obscure band to me like it's always been in the conversation that's why it's been interesting to watch it go from this thing that was always in the conversation to being this thing that people are now kind of fixated on and, and talk about a lot. Like it's really, uh, you know, um, uh, Sam McFeeters writes a lot about the crucifix in his new book or his book that came out a couple of years ago now. And they what's are, that uh, called? I'm trying to remember what it's called. I'll, 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 uh, I'll figure a way to send it to you. So I can, sure. Yeah. Sure. I'm blanking on the name right now and I feel bad about it. I'll fix this in the intro. So I'll let people know where to get it. And he was on the show before and we talked about the crucifix on that episode as well. Oh, funny. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Like it's, it's such a, it, it, you know, like you need those bands that scare people and kind of push things. You need that in all art, I guess. Right. So you know where the limits are. And mm -hmm. I think they're crucifix are the Midwest version of that band. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it would have been very different though than the scene you kind of wind up in, or is it kind of the same thing? Did Sonic Youth ever play with the Crucifix early on? No. How no. were you? How how did you first meet them? Because they were um, the, they came through Laughing Hyenas, I know later on, right? That yeah, that was that was all my connection. I mean, I mean, knowing Larissa and and John back from the Michigan days, um, but but. Um, Thurston found out about the Crucifix uh, because of Maximum Rock and Roll. He bought that cassette and he and Lee came to uh, the Sunday Hardcore Matinee at CB's and I, I met them there. At the time, we had we had been talking about possibly Lee recording the next uh, Crucifix record. Oh, wow. At, War at Wharton's. Um so is that the one that Corey kind of started that never got finished or never came no, out? No, no, that's that's the the first material. That's um, Corey re just re basically recorded. Um, I think that's the demo tape. Basically, I think oh. that's Corey's uh, touch and go recording, which just never none of it ever came out other than that cassette. And one one song came out in the uh, the touch and go uh, uh, reissue that came out. Okay, yeah, uh, the yeah. touch and go magazine reissue. Yeah. Um, there's one song in there, but, um, but thirst, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm spinning around, but, but, uh, Thurston no, Lee came, came to a, the CB that's show. A, that's the whole point of behind the show. Ramble, okay. please. <laughs> um, and I, I met them there and, um, was talking to Lee about recording. Uh, um, that's how I started a relationship with you guys. We were going to come to New York and record, but, um, the band imploded and, um, the bass player Mark Hauser and I wound up moving to uh, to New York instead of uh, recording there. Did you do any bands in New York before? Because Sonic Youth comes back from that European tour famously, and Bob leaves the band, and and that's when you join the band. But were you doing other bands before that in New York? Yeah. No, I was going to auditions. Okay. <laughs> what, what it, it, was, it was really funny. Um, I would go to auditions uh, that I would find. Um, in the back of the uh you know the adverts in the back of the in the classifieds of the village voice and um and i would go to these auditions and like one was like everything was like the smiths 
you know, yeah. <laughs> about the band. And and um, and then I went to another one where I, I had to I, I live in New Jersey now for years and years, but I had to I had to go to New Jersey <laughs> and um and get on a bus and uh and uh and then met this black clad rocker <laughs> um uh, um and played with this band who were like a Bauhaus band. <laughs> and so every band was like was like someone who had already happened and <laughs> and so i was going to these auditions and i was like fuck i want to just you know join a band like sonic youth but not like sonic youth you know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but you know you know its own thing but but <laughs> <laughs> so were there ever any bands that you tried out for where you're like oh this could work or is it just like all these no. sort of like freak show things no when when you joined saw so <laughs> not none <laughs> were you kind of were you taking in shows at that time too in new york like, yeah were you yeah 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 the first show that uh that um my buddies and i got to got to see was um somewhere in like a warehouse and in midtown we found this flyer and basically uh it was live skull right at Rat at Rat R, Honeymoon Killers. It was like basically everybody we wanted to see in New York, except for Sonic Youth, you know, because they were in Europe. And so, so we just like happened on the, you know, we were just like sitting down in the front of, you know, watching these, these New York bands play and just like this, you know, this is where we want to be, you know. And um, I don't know if you know much about Rat at Rat R, but they were, they were incredible and they they really stood out amongst uh you know that bill you know i only know the obviously the records but um weirdly there's also i believe mike from the sadies uh, -huh. uh did some project with some people from rat at red r because i remember being our kids go to school or went to school together and i remember him and i having a really deep conversation about the band one morning before our kids went in um, and uh especially a great drummer who i think did just pass away maybe before COVID, uh, but a, a fantastic drummer who was the first great New York City drummer that I that I saw when I moved here. Oh, that's awesome. It's such a cool scene that's happening in New York. Well, rest in peace, obviously, but it is it, definitely a cool scene that's happening in New York around that time. Is it after the poorly dubbed pig fuck scene, kind of like that next wave of bands, or is that still kind of, is the media still trying to make that a thing? I think that's right about the point when I when I moved there, like that show that I went to, I think the media would have called that a classic pig fucker yeah. uh, show, you know, <laughs> yeah, big I, think, fucker, I don't know sorry. if that came from Chris Gow or what, but but um, um, but yeah, I guess I, I yeah, I moved to town in, in, in the middle of that. And so when you get asked to join Sonic Youth, that must have been amazing because now you wound up in a band exactly like Sonic Youth. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of like. <laughs> What was the first Sonic Youth tour you did? It was um, in August of 85. Um, um, we, we were mostly playing uh, Bad Moon Rising material because that album had just come out a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So um, it was uh, booked by Gerard Cosley and um, and it had out into the Midwest. And so I saw all, all my old friends with, you know, uh, to them it was like steve's coming to town he's got his new he's got steve's new band yeah, yeah. you know which was not the case at all you, you know um but um but yeah so we crossed um united states in uh summer of 85 and so uh is that the tour with laughing hyenas is are they on part of that thing or do they play with you guys on that tour i think that's a little too early for them i think they joined us more like 80 88 i think they were a little bit later Okay. Around the time of Daydream Nation, they would have come in. We were... It's interesting, like that era of touring, because it's sort of the the pre everything exploding and changing, I imagine. But it's the post kind of hardcore era. And there's, mm -hmm. I guess, like it's yourselves and, and who's for doing the replacements and, and uh, Dinosaur Jr. around then, too. But like, it's really sort of like the foundation of what would become like alternative music or college rock for a little, little bit referred to. Sure. And I, and I think, you know, Black Flag and S SST made that possible mm -hmm. by by those tours that they did, you know, in, in the early 80s it, it you know, they, they created that network. And and actually the next tour that we did was probably 
booked by Greg Dukowski, you know, not Gerard, who that wasn't his his forte. You know, he was doing a a friend a favor, you know, but um, but so next we were, I guess we were with Global probably soon after that. Yeah, it does. It's that network that comes up time and time again, like DOA and Black Flag kind of setting this sort of uh, roadmap in place that people are still people still use it to this day. Definitely. Definitely. I, I think it changed uh, American music. Yeah, it's it's fast, fascinating interviewing people from like the pre hardcore era of punk versus the post kind of Black Flag DOA kind of era about how they would tour versus mm -hmm. how where it just makes no sense. You would go to like a city and spend like a week there or you'd, <laughs> you know, like just yeah. do all this stuff or like ping pong around yeah. the continent, basically. Yeah. And and then post those these guys coming in kind of with their rigidness, establishing this network. Yeah. And if you talk to Mike Watt, a, the Kano version. Yeah. Kano. Yeah, exactly. Like it's a, uh, I don't know, it's, and it's one of those great things that I think punk that sort of transcends punk into every genre of music, even like, I think it's you know probably in hip hop. This is a touring cycle that people use now or a style hmm. of people touring, you know? Um, what were the, uh, what were the bands that you guys were kind of playing with in terms of like those West coast shows and, and like, what was the scene like that you were, Kind of in 85 yeah in 85 yeah um uh through the midwest it would be some touch and go bands you know uh, um de Kreutzen, um um i'm not sure if we played with tar babies or mecht mensch but but it yeah. would when madison it would be one of those groups and um and then you know if we got out to seattle it would be with um Green River? I think with Green River. Yeah. I don't think they were, I think the first time I played there with, um, with Sonics, it was, it was Green River because Crucifix had just played with Green River too, like a year or so before. So um, it would have been Green River. And then as we got down uh, to Southern California, it would have been more SST type bands. Um, um, I know that we played with the Minutemen once or twice um, early. It would have to be early before D passed um so yeah so we would play with minute men in 85 then yeah it rest in peace obviously uh, once again yeah it's, it's sad. A, he was a favorite you know i loved love d love the minute men they are definitely one of those bands that you know, the records have power and you know I, I pick up and listen to the records but to see them live and you pick this up from watching live bootlegs as well but to see them live was just transcendent yeah yeah, I, I was lucky to see him two or three times and loved it. When did you start feeling things changing? Because it's only a short period of time. Like you guys put it, we're putting out classic records every year for the next few years. But when did you start seeing that, oh, this something's happening? It was a it was a slow ramp every year. And every year you would do something that you didn't do the year before. So it wasn't like what happened to Nirvana, obviously, it was like, it was this real gradual thing. And so we sort of, you know, learned about the business, you got a little more sophisticated with how you dealt with business people. And, and um, it kind of went that way, you know, until we signed with Geffen, then of course, that was a, you know, a burst of money and energy around the band. But, um, but it was, it was odd how natural the band's growth was, you know, like, this year we we went to Australia, New Zealand, and Japan for the first time, you know, and the you know, two years later we went to, you know, the Soviet Union and and you know, just kept on doing like, you know, then after that you would, you know, we went to Southeast Asia and played in in different countries. You know, it was just it was just things that you wouldn't, you know, that first tour, that band tour going to Columbus, Ohio from New York. You weren't thinking that soon you would, you know, that we're going to be in, in Jakarta, Indonesia. You know, it was it, it was a world away. Did you get a vibe early on that this was global with hardcore? Because that's one of the things I love about hardcore. And you see it with this metal as well. Um, but I find with hardcore more so there's like this sort of international network that establishes as well as a national network where, you know, there are bands in Japan, there are bands in Brazil, there's bands in Finland and Max Rock and Roll is a, a great right. place for, for covering this. Like, were you aware of this sort of thing that was happening as well at the same time? I think just mostly through Maximum Rock and Roll mm -hmm. and through and just, you know, the network. You would learn about 
things from the network, you know, you know, from going on tour and, and having, you know, opening for someone and, you know, learning what they had to tell you and, and uh, someone else opening for you. And, you know, it was just, you know, lots of information being shared. It's interesting talking to people around the world that are kind of in punk and alternative music or whatever, like, you know, punk, we'll call it punk, um, where Sonic Youth winds up being that band that comes to play Indonesia or when we went to China talking to kids that saw you guys in China. Yeah. Just like the the kind of like the band that sort of brings this thing in the same way Black Flag and DOA were in America and in Canada earlier on, but internationally to places when you start touring like did you have and i guess that's through the major label this kind of comes but like did you have any hang-ups about signing to the major label was that ever something yeah, yeah oddly i was the 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 one member who was least into it because i was <laughs> such a uh um you know um a diy punker at that point yeah. you know i i uh i think i at that time i would have preferred to go to you know I, I think my dream label at the time was uh was to be on mute proper because mm. um, uh, um, all my heroes were there, <laughs> you know, Nick Cave and, and, uh, and, uh, and Roland, you know, uh, with these, these immortal souls and, and my friend Epic soundtracks on drums. Uh, so I think I wanted to be on mute. Yeah. Rest in peace again. Um, yeah. All of, yeah. Too many of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it is. Uh, uh, it's, it's such a cool label as well and like 4ad i guess would have also been a place you guys could have fit in on at that time but everything is so much smaller at that yeah point. maybe but that was a little bit it it had a little bit more of their own style and so i i don't think sonic youth would have been able to have that imposed on them you know yeah 4ad sort of had a look um and yeah i, I don't yeah. think we would have fit <laughs> it's funny because there's a more of a universal or uniform look to their records and a uniform sound to their records Mm -hmm. with 4AD but you're right like it does have a a very similar but I think that's the thing that like a lot of indie labels wind up doing where the label in a way becomes not bigger than the band but like puts mm, itself yeah. out on that way right yeah did, did you run the Sonic Youth fanzine Sonic Death um no but I was sort of um the in-between um, I was I was a member oh wow big yeah, fan yeah Oh wow, that's so funny! <laughs> I love that thing. Yeah, pre, <laughs> but also that was a, you know, in terms of uh, getting a cool fanzine, there was definitely so much stuff that I still, because there was that reissue that came out of Art Metropole in Toronto, of all the issues, like a compendium, mm. like years ago, I think early two thousands, mm. and I and I picked it up when it came out, and I still go through. I'm still learning from. Oh, fanzine. funny, funny, yeah. There's like so much deep cut stuff and just like every genre yeah. is covered. Every, yeah. All... You know, there was just so much going on in that time and you were just so excited to like, you know, spread the word. Like, have, have you heard this? You know, that's that was how things were. What was it like going to Japan for the first time? Like what bands did you play with? <laughs> well we played with the boredoms you know? of course yeah that makes sense sorry i shouldn't have <laughs> yeah it was yeah yeah i think um pussy galore actually had beat us to japan and they said you got to play with this band <laughs> you know they're insane they're they're like a japanese butthole surfers you know and um and you know and, and they were of course fantastic and they became very much their own thing and not not um not a japanese butthole surfers at all very much the boredoms you know at, through the years so um J japan was the greatest you know it was you know you felt like you were on uh uh you know a capitalist disneyland of, of you know of just you know of, it was truly a capitalist wonderland you know walking around there every record the, store everything you could want to buy <laughs> definitely well the records yes but the the big thing back then for for us was coming home with these <laughs> with these vhs's of boot of uh american bootlegs you know like the stooges and alice cooper and <laughs> and james brown on soul train you know there would be these video stores that would sell you know illegal vi videos and um if if they had your band in their collection they would give you 10 free videos <laughs> so we would all walk out of there with bags of you know vhs's and stuff them into our our you know our suitcases to take home that's awesome were you aware of gizem 
No, I don't know what that is. Oh, Gizm, uh, G-I-S-M, or Gizm, ah. I guess. But they were like, Sakevi, the lead singer, is the guy who, I guess, attacked the audience with a flamethrower one time. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Threw a saw blade in the crowd. But they were, uh, I, I, like, I'd, I'd be fascinated to talk to Sakevi and see if the Crucifix weren't weirdly <laughs> an influence. But it's almost like you guys are starting at the same time. And mm. his voice is kind of similar to Doc's in a mm -hmm. lot of way. So it would, it's, I don't know, it's just like amazing how there's these two confrontational bands on the other side of the world that, and also they sonically don't really fit in as a punk hardcore band too. Like they're doing all sorts of weird experimentation. Mm. Poison Idea covers them on mm. a, a later record. And what, um, what do you, what do you think Doc was uh, in, influenced by vocally? I don't know. I've always, I wanted to ask you because it is one of the most, <laughs> I think that's the that's the barrier of entry to mm. that band. And I think we finally mm. hit a point in music. We've hit the tipping point in music where people are just so open that I don't think Doc's voice is a stumbling block to people mm -hmm. as much. But I remember the first time I heard it, I was like, why is he doing this? Like <laughs> why? <laughs> I think um Howard Howard Devoto. Yeah. That and makes the Buzzcocks. Sense. Yeah. And the Buzzcocks. Yeah. Um <laughs> Public Image by by public image the specific song yeah 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 well i wonder like did he try any other voices first or did you hear was that the voice he came in with no i think that was it because he's also yeah, well go on yeah because similar items and hinkley had a vision would have been uh er early tunes that we would have learned together so yeah he he, he was already singing like that it's interesting because he's an older guy on the scene too right like because he's slightly older than you I believe. Yes, he was way older. <laughs> he was, you know, we were just out of out of you know a, a year or two out of high school, and he was like thirty one, <laughs> <laughs> and he was married, and you know, and like, like or, or no, he he'd already been divorced. You know, he was thirty one <laughs> and divorced, and it, it was like holy fuck, this we're playing with this older guy. <laughs> it it definitely. Uh... It's definitely weird how that's something that happens in punk and hardcore where, um, and you know, not to say that this isn't abused and I, so I should acknowledge that, but at the same time, it is this weird Peter Pan Neverland situation mm -hmm. where, yeah, like I had, I had friends in their sixties when I was like a teenager because <laughs> we traded records yeah. and, it, and yeah. when you fit, you know, you found someone that yeah. liked this kind of music, you're going to be like, oh, we're going to be friends no matter how old you are. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Doc was, Doc was 31 and we were maybe you know, 20 or, and so it was, it was a, you know, it was a big difference as far as life experiences, you know, and, but he hadn't done any other bands before this either. Right. No. Um, I think failed attempts, but yeah, I think he probably couldn't, he couldn't get along with anyone until <laughs> punk rock came along. <laughs> yeah. There's so many yeah. interesting personalities like that in another era, there's no way like Marky e. Smith <laughs> would be making music <laughs> right you know, like the, it took... the folk scene of 72 or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> i guess i get it once again unless you're in new york and you could be on esp and be the fugs and be yeah like yeah, a free yeah. flag fly yeah you know um <laughs> not that you've asked this to be a doc appreciation hour or anything no i i love but, this but uh one of the the greatest things about being friends with this guy so many years ago and I haven't talked to him for decades um but but was that he was such a a record nerd and and it was not punk only like he he um in Michigan there was this weird thing where you know in those pre-punk years a lot of those fan people who would become fans of punk they were listening to prog rock from the uk and so mm -hmm. doc had all this prog and, and you know i wasn't as interested in that but everything that came just before the punk explosion too and and of course the hippie hippie movement too um he, he had all the good stuff you know and that's really what we bonded on was um was neil young and the beatles uh that's where that's where doc and i really um really connected it, it's it's amazing how Michigan has that kind of streak of people just being like deep music heads. Like, you know, mentioned the prog mm -hmm. stuff like Groundhogs and I guess Hawkwind as well. Like there is sort of that. Yeah. And but there was a certain 
guy and it was a guy he was a man it, it was there was a certain guy who would have a really good stereo and would yeah. be able to buy those records and it, it seemed like and he was always older you know and and our thing was a little bit more juvenile you know so but there was always someone who like knew about those like <laughs> those weird ass king crimson records that, <laughs> that you know that we didn't know about but you know pre pre uh pre the later uh stuff and just so it was weird that just that those guys often became punk aficionados. Mm -hmm. Well, it's there's a, I get a sense from talking to people, especially people that were around an active pre-punk, that there's like this sense of waiting for this to happen. Like just these people being like, fuck, I'll cling to this, I'll cling to that. And then when punk finally happens, it's like, all right. And you know, obviously their definitions are varied on what punk is, but this was like this thing that was building. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that with the proto like dr feel good and mm -hmm. some of this, the, the detroit stuff we talked about michigan stuff and radio yeah. birdman even in australia and the same right. stuff it it really does feel like this was a a culmination that just sort of crests it's if you bring up like the the record collector thing in michigan too i find that like you talked to john brannon and he you know he when he was on the show he talked about playing uh nirvana uh lead belly for the first time and stuff like it does feel like there's oh, like wow yeah. yeah, there's like a deep music head appreciation for all types of music, not just, you know, capital P punk rock. Yeah, I guess being that that um, we weren't really a metropolitan city area, if you weren't in Detroit and still and Detroit was having its own issues at the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s. Um, so, yeah, yeah, things things got to us a little bit more more slowly, you know, and so. Um, you know, you listen to uh, Led Zeppelin and Neil Young remained relevant, you know, um, yeah. even when all this other stuff happened, you know, Thurston makes this joke about, you know, in the early 80s, everybody sold their Zeppelin records. And then a few years later, you know, after Sub Pop, they all went out and bought, <laughs> rebought your Zeppelin records. Well, <laughs> if you came from Michigan, you never got rid of them. It's like I still had, you know, Led Zeppelin two and three and what, whatever. I guess meeting Neil Young later on being such a fan would have been a huge deal yourself <laughs> mind blower yeah. yeah 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 was it was it interesting that he was like a fan of the band like there's a certain point where the band becomes just a part of americana like you're on the simpsons you're like it's it transcends like any sort of alternative music to just become you know pop music it's not the musically obviously it's always fascinating and challenging and and i'm a fan the whole way through but at the same time it's like the world catches up to you a little bit uh -huh. um um yeah I, I i don't know you just try and keep keep it interesting you know and keep um I, i'm not sure what to say about that yeah it's kind of a heavy question i mean to, kind of <laughs> hit you with that one. <laughs> no i mean i, I mean it's I, i'm just not sure you know we um uh, yeah i'm not sure how to answer sorry no it's 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 fine because i think it's you know, it's the band that gets me into music, you know, and it's actually you playing drums on schizophrenia in the year 1991 mm. punk broke with a maraca where I'm like, what the fuck is this? And like mm. the one of the footage that they kind of cut to that was just like uh, like a huge eye opener for me. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I, I, I Sonic Youth's the band that I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about. You know? huh. And the Crucifix, too. Like, that's what I was saying. I got a lot to punish you about on this episode. <laughs> was there any show just to wrap up that kind of sticks out in your memory in terms of the crucifix that was like well this might have gone too far tonight i don't know there were some shows where we definitely hated each other you know there were some really negative shows um um i i guess it's not it's not controversial to say for all of doc's positive points there were there was a lot that was very difficult to deal with. I, I, I everybody knows, right? It, yeah, it, that's it fairly was, established. Yeah, yeah okay. like, like that's why I bring it up because, like, in the in American hardcore, uh, not American hardcore, sorry, in 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 Tony Retman's book, why be something sure. that you're not? Um, there's a very brief chapter about the crucifix, and most of the people interviewed in it, like yourself, you've got a, a quote in the band where you don't even seem, you know, you seem like you're conflicted about the legacy a little bit in the quote. Uh. And certainly the other two quotes are from people that have not as great things to say about the band. Like, it feels like it would have been 
And I think that's why I find it so fascinating because it almost is like a an art project more than mm-hmm. it is yeah. a clash style band. Yeah. That's funny that you say that. Uh because and I'm sorry I'm gonna um take a left hand turn, but but that's how we used to describe negative approach. <laughs> <laughs> As an art project? First, yeah, when we first saw them, yeah. We thought it was an art project. Yeah. That's amazing. I, yeah. I I love them. To me, they're yeah. You know, like John is my uh, my Frank Sinatra. Like that's where yeah. I yeah I go for. Yeah, no, and it, it wasn't. And it was not a, a a diss in any way, but it just like we thought it was artful the way that it was so extreme. I guess. I guess the yeah the ex- how extreme it was made us think that it was was an art project. <laughs> It's funny too, coming from the crucifix too, who are pretty extreme <laughs> in their own right. <laughs> I guess everyone's got a different definition of extreme. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We're <laughs> um, we're from the land of the Stooges. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's the thing that kind of permeates the whole thing the way through i find it although fascinating when you talk to john sorry to go on but like yeah yeah how much he didn't he rejects that first wave of detroit punk stuff he's like no that shit was just rock music it yeah sucked. yeah well you know and also although not a, as big of a deal to john but to a lot of us that was the bar scene and we, and just that was so far that was that was like going to a stadium rock gig you know it was just so hard to get there you know so we didn't we didn't see those bands, even though we, we kind of existed at the same time. We had to go to the underage uh, shows, you know. Well, because there's so many, like, Cold Cock, like, yeah, uh, yeah, Ivories. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I love those bands, too. Yeah. And it's funny, because, like, I, I bring them to John, and John's like, oh, shit, that's just, yeah. <laughs> that's just rock, bar rock yeah. bullshit. And John knows that shit better than I do, but to us, that was the stuff that was in the way. <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah. it was from five years ago, and and if you're not, you know, L7 or, or, you know, you know, whatever, um, we're not interested. What about the flesh columns from Windsor? Like they kind of would have been towards the tail end, I guess, of the crucifix, right? Yeah. Yeah. I I might've seen their name on a flyer. We were, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know much from Windsor only that the radio was better and that maybe there was a show over there that we could play, which we never got to. But we always knew the radio was was great in Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But we so did we... go to um, we did go to L seven and the Crucifix went to London, Ontario together. Oh wow! Where did you do you play with like the hippies or NRG uh, or? No, we went we went to do. Um, God, I, I wish I had a little bit more info on this for you because you would you would know about it, but. We went to do a two-day residency in London, Ontario. This would have been 82 or 83. And um, we stayed above the bar. And it was like a flop house. Like, um, like you know, men coming in and sleeping there at night with with TB and stuff. And in, in, in these these various rooms where we stayed. Was it called... Um, was it um, not called it was the... was a office. West, Western it's name. A, yeah. It was a cowboy you, name. Indulge me for one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can. Yeah, I'll wait. We went there um, for two nights, and um, the first night we we got so much um, flack from the crowd, like kind of redneck flack. Um, and at one point, someone like lift. Larissa would wear these like um, sundresses, uh, old you know vintage sundresses, and and. Uh, and someone lifted up her her dress and like someone jumped and a fight started, you know, like protecting Larissa. And wow. And then we we didn't get to play the next night. Um, we but we didn't we didn't work well with uh, the clientele, <laughs> just the Crucifix and L7 and this this uh, bu- kind of like a biker bar in London, Ontario. I think it's called. um Man, I'm blanking because I think it was around for a long time with the hotel above it. And I think like like uh, Dave Dichter taught, wrote about it in Max Rock and Roll as being a place that he relapsed into smoking crack one time. And there's just that like would be a, a place to do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was. Yeah. It was a bizarre, a bizarre place. Yeah. It, it definitely I, I thought I pulled the record and it does not unfortunately have a picture of it on the cover because there is like a weird little punk scene 
that I wonder if these were all kids that would have seen you guys play or something, mm -hmm. because it does have a very kind of similar bend to L7. Like it's sort of darker punk, the like hippies, mm -hmm. uh, NJF, and this band, the generics, but they're all kind of like post punky, gothy kind of punk bands that would have been 84, 85. They're putting out their records. I'll see if I can find the name of it and, and I'll, I'll text it to you or something. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to see that. That's awesome. That's wild. Yeah. But, but that, that was, a, that was a, that was a good one though. Um, uh, and spending time with L7 um, who, who we just worshiped. We thought they were the, the greatest thing. And, you know, and, and I don't know if you're curious, but, but, you know, as great as the third man record is, and I'm so happy to see that it still didn't, uh, capture them you know there, there's still something that um that i wish i could um enlighten everyone too about how how fantastic that band was you know and it came across you know live in these clubs you know in lansing detroit and ann arbor and yeah like i love this the you know the the old seven inch and obviously that reissue that came out i think is fantastic but they're one of those bands that only through talking to people that were there for it like you know you get the scope of how important this band was that like this is more than the necros or more than negative approach or more than anyone like this is the band from that scene that we kind of carry that them. era yeah for, for me yeah, yeah that's the one that spoke to me and that's and that's what i took with me when i left and you know and moved to new york and i didn't know what was going to happen you know yeah so but but l7 they were that was my inspiration from michigan uh, what did you think of Touch and Go Fanzine and, and sort of Tesco V and that whole kind of meat men kind of world? I think I was I was fascinated with it. And and it was great that, you know, your band would actually get reviewed, you know, uh, you know, live, even even your even a band that didn't have a record, you know, they would review, which was which was fantastic. And I think that sort of type of music press was 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 a new thing to me. So so a lot of it, um, a lot of it was not really my style um it it did feel a little dark and negative for for me at the time um a lot of the humor was not really my style of humor but um but it was important to us you know and um and um and uh tesco was is a is a wonderful guy and uh was you know there were a lot of sides to him and he was, he was a super intelligent person to to get to know it's amazing how when you think about like that forced exposure of Gerard doing conflict, like there was sort of this real dark humor, but very sort of similar aesthetic to most of that sort of big underground music press around then. Mm -hmm. They all kind of had that same sort of vibe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where exactly where that came from. You know, it was sort of like, um, I don't know, like no one's watching <laughs> and, and like, so you know, sometimes, you know, bad behavior would happen or, um, or sort of, um, you know, um, sarcastically using bad behavior, you know, I think it's also an, an, an irony or whatever. Yeah. Like testing limits too. And sort of obviously stuff that doesn't age and doesn't, you know, I, I don't yeah. think Gerard will ever, you said straight up, he'll never ever reissue conflict fanzine. <laughs> I don't think there's any, yeah. any chance of that ever happening, yeah. but yeah, but it's, it was at the time it was the, I don't know, like, like you're saying, like it, no one's watching and you know, you're testing limits and sort of this and it, but it's interesting to see where that goes because that ultimately leads to vice, you know, like that sort of like mm -hmm. approach to. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. And which then ultimately leads to, you know, wherever that led. You know, mm -hmm. there's this sort of, uh, and it's interesting to follow these sorts of threads and sort of these like little ripples that wind up being huge reverberations. Right, right. Well, this has been a huge reverberation <laughs> for me, Steve. And anytime you want to come back on this show and and please just feel free to give me all of the crucifix stories you have. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I, are all, I've forgotten most of them. I've forgotten most of them. <laughs> But thank you. It was a really a nice talk, and I, I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you, Steve, for coming on this show. And anytime Steve wants to come back here, you're always welcome, buddy. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Once again, pick up uh, 
all you can by Steve Shelley that he's playing with Bush Tetris or Sonic Youth, or if they ever do put out those Crucifix records again, grab some of those as well. Sam McFeeder's book, Mutations. Definitely read that. Lots of great Sonic Youth stuff. I could just go on forever talking about Sonic Youth things. There's a live bootleg, something Tiger. I can't remember right now off the top of my head. As I say, it's late. Uh, on that bootleg, they do a encore of all Ramones covers. Oh, it's a fantastic thing. I think I got it as part of the Sonic Death fan club. All right, that's it. Uh, coming up on the next episode, well, we don't know. Because it's <laughs> so uh, so up in the air right now with uh, these uh, punk rock bowling episodes that are going to be going up. So I don't really know what's coming up. Uh, but there's going to be something awesome. And uh, that's it for me. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives and issues of Indigenous peoples all over the world matter. We need to protect trans kids and help trans people protect themselves and their rights. And stop hate and violence towards people of different faiths, different races, different nationalities. Because we are not talking about politics here. This is just basic human rights shit. Ceasefires are just basic human rights shit. People deserve to be able to live free from hate and violence and discrimination. So if there's organizations that are affecting positive change in your community... And you want to get involved, get involved. I'm sure they could benefit from your time or if you can afford it, some money or whatnot. Uh, things that also get better when you get involved, punk. Anyone can do this shit. Start a band, start a fanzine, start a podcast, whatever. Eh, podcasts, yeah, start a band, start a fanzine. They're cooler. Uh, but anyone can do this shit. If I can do it, you can do it. Uh, so go there and, and do it. And it's never too, uh, too late to start. Everything, you know gets easier when you get older maybe i don't know about that <laughs> it gets way fucking harder uh, but go there and get involved speaking of get involved sign your organ donor cards by the time they come looking for those organs you don't need them and i've seen the miracles happen that they can perform so sign those cards uh and then finally try meditating i know i'm not the first person to tell people this but maybe it'll work for you it worked for me and uh once again i am not any uh, paragon of health and wellness. So if it works for me, it's it might work for you. Stick with it. There's lots of free places to try it. All right, that is it for me. Thank you for listening. See you on the next episode. Bye. It's punk rock bowling time. That's right, for the 24th year, one of the greatest festivals on earth in my opinion, returns to downtown Las Vegas the weekend of May 25th, 26th, and 27th. I have had some of my greatest times playing this thing and just hanging out of this thing. You want to know how much this festival speaks to Turn Out of Punk's mindset? The headliners are Devo, Descendants, and Madness. Every day of this festival, the lineup is stacked with amazing bands of all types and stripes of punk and hardcore from all different eras, from ska to post-hardcore. We're talking like Bratmobile to Rock from the Crypt to Stiff Little Fingers to the Cosmic Psychos to Scowl to Chad. I just... And then there's also all these late night after shows which are happening. And you wouldn't believe the lineup of these things from the Zeros to Agnostic Front and everything in between, this festival is out of control for fans of punk. Uh, so I hope I will see you there. Because this isn't like some sort of festival that you just go to and the bands are secluded in some sort of backstage area. Bands and fans and just punks alike are all just taking over downtown Las Vegas. So you turn around and all of a sudden you're gambling beside John Doe from X. I don't, I don't know if John Doe gambles but if you turn around on the buffet line you'll probably see me and you better believe we're going to be talking about punk music and because this festival loves this podcast as much as this podcast loves this festival punk rock bowling is bringing you a series of special episodes so each and every week i will have an episode going up featuring someone that's playing this festival and hot damn are there some good ones coming Head over to punkrockbowling.com and hopefully I see you in downtown Las Vegas, May 25th, 26th, and 27th.